want to make things that make things better, have fun doing it, and learn to help yourself and everyone around you flourish? Well, you've come to the right place. Welcome to Enliven. This is the show where we explore what's possible and the people, the principles, and the practices that are going to help you build enlivening products and enlivening organizations. I'm your host, Andrew Scottsko, and my guest in this episode is Sushant Zanganapur. Sushant is a social scientist and a serial entrepreneur with a long history of working to solve problems at the intersection of public policy, business, technology, and systems change. In 2018, he founded Sway, a platform to help organizations create idea meritocracies by sourcing, evaluating, and improving ideas from all people in the organization, which leads to higher quality decisions and greater buy-in. Before Sway, Sushant led a global impact strategy consulting firm and was a director at the Skoll Center, which is a global epicenter for social entrepreneurship. He's been a board member of the Harvard Business Review Advisory Council, as well as an advisor to numerous startups. And on top of that, he's been an adjunct professor or guest lecturer at the master's level to multiple universities around the world. In this conversation, Sushant and I talk about the origin of Sway and how to connect your personal narrative to a problem to create emotional buy-in. We talk about how to think about systemic problems and design interventions to things you don't know how to solve yet. And most fun for me, we explore Sway as an in-flight case study of how to think about and design interventions for the big systemic problems that we care about in the world. Sushant is one of the best systems thinkers and one of the most passionate social entrepreneurs that I know. And in this conversation, I think you'll see why. Please enjoy learning with one of my favorite people. With that, I give you Sushant Zanganapur. Sush, my friend, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm great, man. Thanks so much for being here. And, you know, first off, I just have to say what a treat it is for me to have you on the show. Uh, you know, you and I have been friends for years now and always just have the most fun, like epic, wide ranging conversations where it's always like, I don't even know what we're going to get into, but I always know it's going to be good. And I'm going to be glad that we had that conversation. So real treat for me to have you here and appreciate you taking the time. Buddy, I'm I'm so honored to be on the show. It's come a long way since you first started thinking about it uh, a couple of years ago, and excited to to share our story. Well, why don't we just dive right into it? So we're talking today about Sway, about your company, and sort of getting into it as an example that's in flight about how does someone who is very caring, who very much cares about the world and wants to see the world get better, actually do something about it, right? We have lots of systemic problems. Uh, you've spent a career uh, studying said problems and you're, that brings you up to where you are today. So why don't you just, for the listener, why don't you just give a quick explanation of what is Sway and then we'll talk about how did it come to be? Very concretely, what Sway is, is a uh, platform for idea management for the collection of ideas from a group of people and for a collective decision-making process. Companies, uh, cities, organizations, they deploy Sway to try to collect the best ideas for some of the more complex problems they have. Uh, Sway helps them create a competition to select the best ideas from. You do this through a number of ways. Um, we use some AI algorithms to help people improve the presentation and uh, communication of their idea. And then we use different uh, voting mechanisms and, and other kind of collaboration tools to help filter the quality of the ideas. So the combination of these things helps an organization deploy the platform and sort of sit back and wait for the best ideas to bubble up through this process. And what happens is uh, usually the ideas that survive uh, the, the process have a lot of their biases removed, have a lot of their risks identified, and have a lot of popular support before they reach a decision stage. I think that the natural segment of this is like, why? Where, like, what are you trying to do with this? Uh, we think that the, the, the traditional process for decision making, which is a, usually an expert driven, closed, top down, uh, hierarchical kind of process is super efficient, but it's filled with a lot of cognitive bias. And this cognitive bias leads to, uh, you know, groupthink and a number of other things that, uh, impact the kind of decisions we make and impacts the morale and engagement of people inside the organization that are part of the process. These two things are cancers for any kind of organization, whether it's a government entity or, uh, you know, a high growth company. Uh, 
making decisions a different way, uh, this kind of bottom up competitive way allows you to deal with the bias problem and the disengagement problem at the same time while giving you efficiency. So that's what we're trying to do. Thanks for that sort of setting that context for, for me and for the listeners. So if I'm understanding you right, really what you're trying to do is you're creating an idea marketplace, right? You're creating a very inclusive and equitable idea marketplace within any organization. Um, and it sounds like the reason that's important is because most organizations are very top-down, hierarchical, centrally controlled, and really don't give all the people in those organizations a chance to actually really fully contribute their ideas and have those be considered on par with the idea of a senior stakeholder. 100%. Uh, th- the only difference is we add... Uh, a lot of metrics to ensure that the ideas that make it are worth the time of those that are considering it. So it's not just a PR exercise. Uh, it, it's actually a useful strategic exercise for, for any organization. I actually want to go into the backstory of this because this is where you are today, but I've had the, the kind of privilege of seeing, you know, the behind the scenes stuff for the last couple of years. So I, I'd love you to talk a little bit about how you settled on this, on working on this idea? Because I know it's gone through quite a few evolutions and has kind of some deep roots in your personal history uh, in terms of why this you know moves you so much. Yeah, okay. Uh, we could go really deep on this uh, or stay like, you know, at the 10,000 foot stage. L- let, me, let me go back five years and then we can go back to my early childhood after that. Um, okay. I, look, this started for me in... 2013, 2014, uh, I used to be a director in a large foundation, uh, in the UK, in the UK, in Oxford. And, uh, I was in charge of strategy and was a skull. Yeah. This was at the school center. I was head of strategy and operations there. And, uh, this was a center or center focused on social entrepreneurship, uh, investing in, uh, up and coming venture ideas, uh, investing in research, convening uh, different stakeholders to rethink what business does in today's world. So a very kind of multifaceted uh, function, a lot of different programming and uh, a lot of investment into different things. Mm-hmm. So the strategy development process and the budgeting process were always like sore points for, for me. Uh, what I saw happen in an organization that's supposed to bring about all this good was that there were a lot of really important decisions driven down through the organization from the board or from a couple of very senior members that had very little consultation and very little uh, scrutinization. Uh, And so what what would happen is they wanted program managers to implement some of these pro, some of these ideas mm-hmm. uh, without having their say or buy-in into their execution. What do you think is the result of that? Well, yeah, what I imagine is when you're just when things are just getting handed down like that, like orders. I mean, people are going to be pretty probably disengaged and they're like, you know what? Like, clearly, you don't you don't really care that much about what I have to say. You're just telling me, you know, you're treating me like a like a cog in a machine or like a you know an automaton, and you just want me to do follow your you know do your bidding. Yeah, I mean, certainly that's how people do disengage. They they feel like it's tokenistic, uh, the the type of engagement that they're offered. Uh, they don't have a chance to scrutinize the assumptions of any of these programs. They certainly don't have a chance to contextualize what happens with those programs. So what happened was not only did people disengage and we lost a lot of productivity and morale and these types of things, but the outcomes of the programs that we were trying to uh you know, implement, we're going in the wrong directions because we didn't have on the ground data. Mm. So this was super frustrating for me. I, I put, uh, you know, really big, uh, strategy document together and I sort of went back to present how, how things could be if we considered other options. And I got a really, really negative response from, some of the directors, some of the more senior folks there mm. saying like, you know, why are you questioning our logic? And it's, it's not a, I wasn't dissenting. I was trying to make sure that we, we had our basis covered, that all the biases I thought were there were, were addressed, or I was trying to address my own biases through this process. Mm-hmm. From there came the idea of, okay, how could this whole process been different? Mm. We're going to spend four or 5 million pounds a year on a number of programs, how could we have hit the targets better? 
uh, could various members of the of the organization put proposals together anonymously? And could they have edited those ideas with the help of AI? And through a collaboration process, could those ideas have gotten better through collective scrutiny? Mm. And could the best ideas have gone to the board blindly for the board to decide what is the best set of options we have, not just what does Mr. X think or what does Mr. Y think? Mm. That's where the idea came from. It sounds like you're, what you're really trying to create is, uh, to quote Ray Dalio, uh, an idea meritocracy, right? Where, ev- where it's really about the ideas, not who happened to say the idea. One million percent. I had no idea who Ray Dalio was. I didn't know what idea meritocracy was. And I was pitching sway to Tim O'Reilly at Aspen. Uh, I was invited to the Aspen Ideas Festival as a scholar in 2017. And I got, he got off the stage. We had a conversation and he's like, dude, you're building idea meritocracy. Like, do you know Ray Dalio and Bridgewater? And I'm like, no. Oh. He's like, go read his book. You know, he's, he operates the whole company based on this and he credits a lot of the very important investment decisions that they made, as well as the operational policy decisions they made based on this principle, this cultural principle of, uh, you know, competition uh, around the best ideas. Yeah. And just, just for the listener, for anyone who's not familiar with Ray Dalio and Bridgewater, it's basically the most successful hedge fund ever. Ray Dalio and, and Bridgewater have been just staggeringly successful. I mean, this is a guy on the short list for like every, you know, the head of every World Bank calls Ray Dalio when they're trying to figure out what's actually going on. Uh, and the book that we're referring to is his book from, I don't know, two years ago or something, a couple years ago called Principles, yeah. which is amazing and an absolute must read. And anyways, the, what Sush is, is pointing out here is that the idea of an idea of meritocracy is one of the foundational things that Ray Dalio credits with making Bridgewater so successful. So anyway, Anyways, keep going, Sush. Yeah. So where, you know, going back a little bit to the, to the personal history, where this made a, a really strong connection was I, I grew up in a uh, very political environment. Uh, the age of five, uh, not by choice, really, but by circumstance. Uh, at the age of five, my parents and I left Iran because of the revolution and because of how bad the the living conditions and situation was there. Uh, this was towards the tail end of the Iran-Iraq war. So you can imagine eight, nine years of war, a uh, solidified uh, extremist kind of hardline uh, government, uh, very repressive social policies and very little upward mobility. Uh, <clears throat> my parents uh, smuggled us out of Iran, my brothers and I, and uh, we ended up in Canada and from that point on, I, I became uh, maybe unconsciously at that time, but more consciously as I got older, very, very sensitive to abuse of power. Mm. It's a, it's an allergy. I can't stand it. If I see it happening in certain places, particularly at a systemic level, I I react uh, very kind of not nicely towards it. So when I saw this happening inside the workplace that this was, uh, you know, we're enabling processes that lead to abuse of power, that the abuse of power is a consequence of these processes. I thought, how could that be different? Mm. But where I got very excited was, my God, what I'm experiencing inside the workplace and what I've experienced inside the workplace for, for many years, whether it was at, at management consulting firms, at research institutes and, you know, think tanks to uh, working in the foundation, is similar to what I'm seeing happen in our public spaces with our with our democratic institutions. Hmm. Right now, inside uh, our democracies, inside our cities, our only engagement options are to protest, vote, or disengage. Yeah, these three um, kind of binaries in a world where information and expertise is so distributed and nuanced. These three options seem like just the wrong set of things that we should have on the table if we're trying to make smarter, more nuanced, cost-effective policies and solutions that have the highest uptake. So I made this connection in my mind that the, the problem I'm seeing in the workplace is similar to the problem I'm seeing in our democracies, is that we have an organizational paradigm 
that's mismatched for the the era that we're living in, for the communication era, for the cultural era, for the technological era that we're currently living in and that we're going to be experiencing. And this gap is getting wider and wider every year that that deficit, uh, I would say the governance deficit or the the uh, expectation deficit is getting wider and wider and it's leading to more and more frustration, more and more apathy, more and more populism as a result of it. I got super excited saying, thinking, look, this sway can be a solution, a systemic solution to changing how these institutions function and eventually replacing the, the middlemen, replacing the need for politicians, the re- replacing the need for having a representative that reflects four or 500,000 people's interests for four years in a very non-nuanced and accurate way. Use a system like Sway, not necessarily Sway, but a system like Sway to create a constructive competition and constructive input into all the solutions that, that we need. And I, I'm so grateful you, you kind of gave that backstory because it um, it made sense to me in a way that it hadn't before, right? And I've known you for a couple of years, but right, because when we first met, you were the governance guy, right? You were obsessed with governance. And, you, you know, I've always known you to be someone who thinks very, very deeply um, about systemic issues, particularly, as you said, the abuse of power and knowing your personal history. Um, but it was it's really interesting for me to understand the through line and the connection to, oh, OK, it's kind of the same paradigm. It's the same model happening in our organizations that you were originally frustrated by in our political systems in our society. And I, I actually if I if I recall correctly, you actually the sway started, but more on the you were trying to, I think, originally solve more of the like actual governance type issues outside the workplace. Is that right? Yeah. A hundred percent. I think it was initially directed towards getting broader uh, input and, and sort of changing the policymaking process. Yeah. Uh, that was the first intention. And then you sort of scale it down to, well, what is a small enough reflection of a policymaking process that's distributed and has wide input and a competition. So we we decided to focus more on smaller organizations and companies because it's still a proof of concept for us. If we can make it work inside a homeowner association, for example, which is a, a micro version of a governance environment, or inside a nonprofit that's doing a an annual general meeting, or inside a, a, a large company trying to collect the best ideas for innovation decisions, we're still trying to prove the same concept that f- this process can produce worthwhile investable ideas and maybe outperform the experts uh, that are in charge of certain these certain types of decisions. Yeah, 100%. I, and I love the, you know, if you zoom way out and look at your strategy here, you're basically saying, okay, if we can do this in the workplace and scale to bigger and bigger companies. Well, every company, every organization is kind of like a mini society. And if you can build the model up over time, you know, there is, I, I can imagine a future uh, where it's possible we could have something like Sway for doing this type of um, mass inclu- massively inclusive participatory uh, idea proposal and decision making at a societal level, like in you know, at, at, to what you alluded, you you alluded to something I've heard other people talk about, which is like, hey, let's get rid of representative democracy. Like, let's let's you know, that was a system designed at a time when communications infrastructure and mass education were at radically different levels than they are today. Let's just do away with the system and have direct voting, for example. Uh, so it's interesting to see that that could be a possibility. It could be. I, I have my reservations around like getting rid of the, the system altogether and like replacing it with direct voting. Uh, I think you still have the cognitive bandwidth uh, problem. There's a very, very good TED talk by a fellow named Christopher Hidalgo or Chris Hidalgo. He spoke last year or the year before at TED around AI to replace politicians. And in his first lead up to his, to his solution, he lays out the structural barriers of direct democracy and liquid democracy and a few other things. And it's people's time. People don't have the time to invest in reviewing 15 proposals a day or 15 bylaws or whatever. So we need to leverage these tools to help us, uh, you know, make better use of our time and, and apply our judicious functions in more specific and useful ways. Andrew, I, I want to go back to 
uh, to one thing. I think you alluded to all the different ways this problem could have been solved. You knew me as the governance guy in uh, SU. My obsession was trying to find like all those questions I kept asking, all the interrogation I would do of all the speakers that would come to SU or our, our folks, is I was trying to put the puzzle together as like, what is the most systemic uh, intervention that we could make to really change this, this paradigm that really changed the system. Because all the other people that I've seen, uh, try are doing things that are very marginal and they're doing things that I don't think will make much difference to, uh, the, the size of the problem that we're seeing. So organizing clever campaigns to get millennials to vote more or other people to vote more. I mean, great. Sure, people should be more civically engaged, but it doesn't solve the problem that your set of engagement options are still one or two binary choices. Mm. This is inappropriate for today's world. It doesn't work. It's it's not fit for scale. Uh, and so I can't get behind, you know, a company that that wants to only get people to vote more. It's just it doesn't make sense. Like, Mm. Let's build the infrastructure of, of tomorrow because it's needed, not because it's hard mm -hmm. and, and we're not there yet. That's a perfect pivot point because you're one of the best systems thinkers that I know. And I'd love to talk. I'd love to dive into that. You know, I love what you just said in terms of you were sitting there over and over trying to put the puzzle pieces together about what is this system? What are the levers? Where are the intervention points? And like, which thing, you know, if I can only do one thing, which thing is going to be the one that makes the biggest difference? I would love to hear you talk about how you do that, because that is a skill set that I think you're uniquely gifted at. And so I would love to hear you share kind of the way you approach a problem that way, because I think a lot of people listening to the show, we all see there's all these big issues in the world. We all have our favorite ones that we really care about and want to work on. But I think a lot of us get stuck on, OK, I see, um, you know, inequity in power structures or I see unconscious bias in, you know, rampant in the world or I see fill in the blank here. What do I do about it? How do I start to approach that systemic problem? So how do you approach that? It's a, I don't want to stay too abstract. And, and I think, you know, smarter people than I do for sure. Um, partly who I am and the things I care about drove me to more macro issues, uh, issues of inequity, issues of social justice. And these issues are not, they're not, they don't happen at a micro level. They're the result of like large policy decisions. They're the result of, uh, power structures that they're the result of framing, they're the result of very subtle things that you need some training in to be able to identify. So I think my training in as a political scientist, uh, I master's in, in public policy. I, I studied poli sci, uh, in, in my, uh, you know, in my bachelor's degree combined with my business training as an entrepreneur, as well as a, a management consultant, strategy consultant, helped me use different cognitive tools to be able to, you know, segment a problem into its different parts mm -hmm. and then be able to attribute, well, what is a driving function of this, of this problem? And what are the, the sort of noise of this problem? What's like the two or three really, really big issues here and what, are, what isn't? So you, you, making a lot of assumptions, you're dissecting things, you're, you're doing a lot of that work in your head with slides and other sorts of stuff. But the, where I think I, I got better at it was in my job while I was at the school center. And when I left and I started my own boutique impact advisory practice, I had a client that wanted me to help them find the best social ventures addressing systemic problems around the world. They organized a million dollar competition where they were giving out non-dilutive capital to these social ventures, social ventures that were actually designed to try to intervene and change a system. Mm -hmm. So I looked at like 600 ventures a, a year, uh, pretty deeply in 27 countries. And I got a sense from, from this is, is like the patterns to look for. Uh, when I was, when I was reviewing these types of ventures and also like how they fit with a system. So, so Suze, just to clarify, when you say a social venture, what does that mean? Uh, it means a company that's trying to solve a social or environmental problem through a 
enterprise model, not through a non-governmental model, not through a social movement. They're trying to do it through the marketplace. They're selling a good or service mm. and they're using that money to fuel the growth and expansion of the company. They go by social ventures, impact ventures. There's a lot of interchangeable names for them. What's an example of that? And what, you know, what are some of those patterns? I know we're still a little bit abstract. So I'll get to the concrete stuff in, in a second. So the way I looked at these, these issues was like, what is the entrepreneur trying to solve? What problem is the entrepreneur trying to solve? The acidification of oceans, excess plastic uh, in our waste systems, you know, food waste. What are the systemic problems, the externalities that this, this entrepreneur is trying to build a venture around and solve? So you're like, okay, cool. Like he, he or she understands the problem or ha has a good grasp of the externality and what leads to that externality. Okay. Mm -hmm. What is the venture that they're building that's going to upend this externality or absorb the externality? Clarify one thing. When you say the word externality, what do you mean? So it's an economic term. It means like if you have a business activity, it creates some outcomes. Mm -hmm. We call those externalities. They can be positive in terms of excess profits or, you know, benefits to a community, or they can be negative. It could be an excess waste, pollution, things that are not captured by your business operation. I see. So it's sort of like the second and third order effects of whatever you're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. And so when you're okay, looking it. at systems change, you always want to look at the, the unintended consequences that the venture or the industry or system did not account for. That's kind of spilling over into society. Climate change is a very good example of and the externality of the system of capitalism. It did not account mm -hmm. for this. It's now gotten to a stage of systemic risk, existential risk to, to humanity. And uh, uh, the levels of pollution in the oceans, like a whole bunch of these types of things are, are externalities of like incomplete systems. Great. Keep going. So, so the entrepreneur is like, I'm going to solve the you know, waste in the uh, excess amount of plastic in the waste stream problem. And she's so like, okay, sweet. Like, that's a great thing to do. How are you going to do that? Oh, you know, we're going to turn uh, the plastic bottles, we melt them down and we turn them into bricks. And then we sell those bricks as, as materials to the construction industry. Without looking at the unit analysis and costs of how can you do that effectively at a price point that is more competitive than brick or whatever the current status quo is, you look at like how much volume can this person actually absorb of this problem? Mm. If he's identified or she's identified the problem as like a, you know, there's like a million tons of excess plastic waste per, per year, you Calculate that at a 10-year uh, horizon. That's like 10 million tons of excess waste. And his, his or her projections are like, well, through our process, we are going to displace 50 tons a year, growing at a growth rate of 20%. Like this is a insignificant dent on the problem. Mm -hmm. If you as an entrepreneur are trying to solve that problem, maybe this isn't the best intervention. Maybe an intervention mm -hmm. that can can actually displace 50%, 60%, 70% through some other process. Forget about turning it into bricks. Think about art. Think about, I don't know, think about a, a movement. Think about something else because you're, the, the goal is not to have a business that survives. It's to solve this systemic problem. So that's how I started thinking about systems problem. It's like, do the, do the interventions and their potential impact actually absorb the size and scale and growth rate of the problems that we're seeing? What I'd love to know a little bit more about is the way you deconstruct problems, right? Because what you just said makes a lot of sense, right? Once you have this great understanding of the problem space, of the impacts going on, then you can be uh, very discerning about your choice of intervention, right? You can say, okay, this problem is, you know, whatever, 10 million tons of plastic a year. It's growing at 10%. You know, the solution I'm looking at here is only going to handle uh, 50 tons a year growing at 20%. Okay, you know, project out into the future. When do those lines cross? It's too far. It's too, you know, it's too slow. It's not going to work. This, this is the wrong choice of intervention. 
But what I'm really curious about is, is the process you go through to get to that level of understanding, right? Because that, that reflects a deep situational awareness and understanding of the ecosystem. So talk to me a little bit about how you did this, whenever the last time you did this with, let's say it was Sway or whenever you last went through this process yourself. Can you talk me through that process? Like what, what did you actually do? It comes to uh, the the example. Um, there there are a few that I could give, but this one I, I had a lot of uh, deep kind of say in. When I we had a venture fund at uh, at school where we made very small twenty thirty thousand pound investments into uh, idea stage uh, social ventures that were trying to solve systemic problems. Mm-hmm. We had a couple of uh, guys. Um, an astrophysicist and a investment banker come and pitch us on an idea to solve climate change through the reforestation of the world. So they come to us and they start laying out the problem. Each year, we lose about 9 billion trees a year due to factors such as deforestation, fire, climate change, human activity and consumption. Year on year, this is growing at a growth rate of like 25%. So 9 billion the next year is like almost 11 billion. The year after that, 13, 14 billion and, and, and. Mm -hmm. So on the flip side, we're only replanting about 6 billion trees uh, a year. Okay. I actually think the number was higher. It was something like 15 billion was the was the loss and we were only planting 6 billion a year. And of the 6 billion that we do plant, the survival rate to maturity of those trees is something around 30%. Wow. We have a net loss of like 13 billion trees a year in this, in this model. Times that by 10 years, right? This is a big fucking problem, right? Yeah. So you're like, okay, you got my attention. So who is, how are you going to plant the deficit? How are you going to solve this deficit? Yeah. And, you know, this is where the range of interventions comes from. Someone can come and say, we are going to start a company that for every tree you buy, we will plant a tree for you. Mm -hmm. Or for every product you buy from us, we're going to divert 50% of our revenues to planting trees. We're a social venture. So you're like, okay, well, let's, let's actually put some numbers behind that and see what is the net impact of that? How much of this problem are you going to be able to displace? Can you eclipse this problem through this intervention? Or is it just a meaningless uh, social like PR kind of position? Is this, is this greenwashing here? So these guys come to us and say, we're inventing a technology. We're combining some technologies together to replant trees at a much faster rate than has been planted through the hand process or through the flyover and seed bombing process. We're going to use drones, a like a BB gun, uh, like a paintball gun with pre-germinated seeds and with a swarm of drones we can plant 300 trees per hour per drone. And if you combine, you you do the math and and combine like 50, 60 drones, we can get up to a billion drones a year with 50 drones flying autonomously in a swarm setting. Hmm. And you're like, okay, sure, you have like production problems. You have to have all those seeds germinated and there's risk of survival and all that stuff. But like, holy shit. That could work. This could work, right? There are technical issues now to solve. There isn't a design problem anymore, Mm -hmm. right? The the design of the intervention is suited to the size of the problem. Yes. Okay. Understood. There's a proportionality there. Basically, the the design of the intervention is matched to the scale of the problem. Uh, These guys wanted to use drones to replant trees. Uh, They had many technical problems to go through. We, uh, We did fund them and... After I left uh, my role officially, I joined the advisory board uh, and remain on the advisory board uh, to help them actually build a company. They've um, gotten to, I think, Series A now uh, in funding. What's the, what's the company called? It was called Biocarbon uh, Engineering, mm-hmm. uh, and they rebranded uh, and restructured under a subsidiary company called Dendra Systems. And they're still trying to solve this problem of deforestation through through the intervention that they're going through. I think there's the, the, there are business model challenges now with how do you get companies to finance this uh, and and not just become another NGO. Yeah, how do you make the, the the whole puzzle of the business work? 
Yeah, that's a whole other problem, right? That's a whole other problem. So let's let's go back upstream, though, to the intervention design like we were talking about there, because th- this is um, an area that is way overlooked in the conversation. I think uh, we have a lot of great stuff in the conversation about like designing business models. I mean, go look up, you know, for the listener, go look up customer development and lean startup and like there's tons. But this area where we're talking about now upstream, there's not a lot here. So that's where I want to go deeper. I think you've done a great job explaining kind of the way of thinking like, like the, the, the kind of thinking you're doing is really the systemic thinking about like, okay, what is this problem? And is this thing we're thinking about doing? Is it, is it a big enough thing? Is it going to actually help at all? Um, or is this really just window dressing? What tools do you use? Like, how do you concretely do this? So it's a, it's a great, great or question. Tools are the wrong word, but like methodologies or... Yeah, like you know, what's, your, what's tomorrow, your dissection process? Yeah, what's your dissection process? Yeah. So it's been a very haphazard combination of existing tools uh, from learning how to write investment memos, which have a very clear structure where you're trying to do a lot of logical narrative building uh, to doing root cause analysis, which is a whole other framework of looking at outcomes and then trying to go back to root causes uh, it, from doing logic models, uh, which are based on if then statements where you have a visual logic model of like, you know, this is my starting input. This is what I put the input in. This is what I create. These are the intended like first order outputs of it. This is the second order outcomes of it. Once you visualize that, then you can start to see where the dependencies are, where the assumptions are from one stage to another and where the, uh, where the gaps of logic are. So I use, I use a bunch of different tools. Like I wouldn't say like we have like a business model canvas for systemic thinking. Like it doesn't exist. You got to put a bunch of things together so that you have a clear picture of like, what is the theory of change here? Yeah. What is the size of the problem that you're trying to address? What is the growth rate of the problem? What are the contributing factors to that problem? Like what is, what is leading to the growth? And then once you have that picture on like the, the left side, uh, the input side, then it's like, okay, the intervention, like what is the design of that intervention? How could that meet or eventually eclipse the growth rate? When, you know, are they using technologies that scale, uh, effortlessly like exponential technologies or is this a Mm -hmm. superhuman human laborious intensive kind of thing which leads you to a marginal cost of delivery and you know whether this thing will ever meet the potential of solving the problem at all in the future or not so the point is like i use a bunch of tools uh those tools help fill a a number of puzzle pieces to give me a, a a clear picture of the problem and then what tools did you use to do this for Sway? I used uh, a logic model. Uh, I I did primary secondary research to to try to put some numbers around the the effects of the problem, like the effect of apathy, the effect of uh, disengagement, the uh, the cost, the, the the hard costs of the bad decisions or biased decisions. We did surveys to to try to understand. Uh, of all the options that are given to people, which ones are they more likely to to get excited about uh, and stuff? Mm-hmm. So there was, uh, yeah, similar types of tools that that I used before: uh, research, uh, cognitive tools, logic models, uh, root cause analysis uh, is is another one. So, and and at the end of the day, I'm making a bunch of assumptions too around what, what I think is the is the most appropriate or most, most effective intervention for the problem. When you say logic model, is that like the logic model framework from, I think it's the Kellogg Foundation? Yes, 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 yes. It's from the Kellogg Foundation. They did a great job in the past trying to kind of explain this in a in some kind of guide. What I did with, the, with that is I, I turned that into a workshop. Hmm. And I used to give this workshop twice a year to leaders in... Uh, kind of head of impact or CEO, executive director of different uh, foundations across the Middle East. Hmm. I worked with the Gates Foundation to to deploy this workshop uh, to them so that they would be able to scrutinize and, and sort of more accurately 
quantify the impact of the the out, the programs that they were running to see whether they're on track, not on track, like whether they're using the right metrics, if if the intervention was doing the thing that they wanted to or not. So yeah, Kellogg model is is great, and there's many different ways to use it. Yeah, no, I love that. Is is that workshop online anywhere that people can go check out? No, it's not. It's uh it's an in-person two-day, very kind of interactive uh process where you like each individual foundation leader uh can either take their a set of programs or they can take the entire thesis or mission of the foundation and start to build a logic model. And so we work together to to apply the the Kellogg framework to the way that they're thinking about their, their impact. And then we, we poke holes into it. We try to help them find the right metrics, uh, help them decide the right cadence of measurement and the right process for measurement uh, so that they have a better sense of what the hell they're doing and whether it's leading to the, like, this is, this is the thing, like, People that are in this space are not here because it's a job. They're here to change something. They're here to irreversibly change something. There are problems in the world that need to be eradicated, right? So these tools help us uh, audit how closely we are to designing them in a way that leads to irreversible change. Otherwise, like, go get a job, go do something else. Yeah, there's a lot of easier ways to spend your time. Totally. 100%. Yeah. And, and for people who are interested in going a little deeper on that logic model, I um, I was trying to think of where, why did that sound so familiar? And uh, it reminds me, it just occurred to me, it was because there was an entire podcast episode that was built on that. So if you go back, check out the Josh Seiden episode. We'll link to all this stuff in the show notes. <clears throat> and Josh, Josh wrote a book called Outcomes Over Output. And the logic model that we're talking about here is actually one of the core inputs to that entire way of thinking. And it's really a way, a very concrete way, whether you're doing this in a business or more systemically in a social venture like we're talking about in this conversation, um, that's a really good resource for thinking strategically like we're talking about here. One other example I wanted to give you, Andrew, uh, two minutes tops, was uh, during the the year-long kind of search for and, and diligence process of the 600 or so ventures I looked at, uh, there were there were a handful that stood out, but one in particular, you know about colony collapse and uh, the the issues that our honeybees face all around the world, correct? I'm I'm loosely familiar with it. Yes. Yeah. So colony collapse is a phenomenon where honeybees are sort of going out to pollinate a particular crop of land, or they're out in the wild, and they come back with. Uh, airborne diseases or uh, bits of fertilizer uh, that lead to basically cancers that, yeah, they spread within the colony very quickly and uh, they happen so quickly that the farmers are not able to respond in time. So they mm-hmm. it's like getting stage four cancer and not having any of the warning signs in advance. A lot of the popular uh, methodology, well, popular research tells you like if you can catch the symptoms of colony collapse earlier, like at stage one, you can use fertilizer and other sort of interventions to limit it. And the the success rate is like 90%, but most people don't see it. And so all your colonies end up like you lose like 70% of your colonies year on year, which do the math. Like we're in, we're in deep shit. Like in 10 years, we may not have honeybees, maybe sooner, five years. So there's the problem. There's the framing of the problem. There are a number of contributing factors to colony collapse. How are you going to solve this problem? Are you going to uh, create a more effective or friendly fertilizer so that it doesn't kill bees? Is fertilizer the number one contributor to colony collapse or is it climate change? Is it ecosystem degradation? Like the cocktail that leads to colony collapse is, is hard to disaggregate and hard to uh, appropriate like which one is the leading factor, but we know it's a combination of those things. Yeah. It's hard to break it down. Totally. So you, it's also inappropriate, I think, to like focus on that as your intervention. People look at, well, how do we increase the number of bees or how do we increase their survival? So again, different choices, different interventions. Someone can say, you know, buy honey from us and we, we create more beehives with every honey that you buy, like the Tom's model for shoes. Mm-hmm. Cool idea, easy to understand from a marketing perspective, but like, is that effective? 
are you still, are you addressing the reason why they're dying mm -hmm. by just having more bees? No. And he, like, unless you're able to create so many that it outpaces the death rate, you're never going to get ahead of the problem. So I saw a venture that really blew my mind. They had re-engineered the actual beehive and installed a number of motion sensor cameras. They'd installed a number of other types of cameras that would, uh, they, and they'd also link this to a database where they, they fed an AI 250 papers that looked at different behaviors of bees, hmm. looking for anomalies in those behaviors. So whenever there was an anomaly, so like the bees would enter the hive, it was a smart hive. The bees would enter the hive and usually when there is a problem with a bee, when someone is has stage one symptoms of colony collapse or, or cancer, they start to act funny. Mm. They go in corners, they, they do things that they're, they normally don't. And all these scientific papers tell you about what those behaviors are. So when this happens, these cameras and the AI system can identify where in the, in the call, where in the hive this is happening, which set of bees, they take screenshots, they sent the screenshots to the farmer so the farmer could come and intervene at like the earliest stages of detection. And mm -hmm. based on their hypothesis and stuff, like they could reverse the death rate from 70% loss to like a 10% loss. Mm, wow. And, and so the other things are like, you know, this exponentials and, and the, the, you know, doubling and accelerated rate of returns and all that stuff. The cameras are getting cheaper. The AI is getting better. Uh, the cost is becoming lower year on year because they're on exponential growth curves. Now you don't need to f worry about fertilizer or a two for one model or whatever. You just need a smarter detection system combining these technologies together. That's what I'm talking about when I'm, when I'm looking at systemic solutions to systemic problems. Yeah. I think the other thing I'm hearing in there is that there isn't always one solution to systemic problems, right? The same way that a systemic problem is so big and you have to, you have to break it down, right? You have to un, kind of unbundle this thing and into its constituent parts. And then it's almost like to solve a systemic problem, it, it, you have to kind of break it down into all the contributing factors and then potentially go after all the contributing factors, right? Which is like, you have to say, okay, you know, there's 10 things that actually contribute to this symptom that we call the systemic problem. But the, if you go to, the, to your point about root cause analysis, you know, there's actually 10 contributing factors here and these are the biggest two. So the biggest thing I can do to have an impact on this overall symptom is to handle this contributing factor and design for that. Knowing that that's not the whole solution, but that's a important pe uh, important piece of the solution. Yeah, and I'm being okay with that because it's like what I see is a failure mode that I've fallen into before, and I think a lot of other people fall into is we get so caught up in the whole problem that we try to boil the ocean, and like that's a phrase for a reason because it doesn't work. I 100% I agree, and I think this is a common human trait. The, these problems are so multifaceted and so big that you can get lost in them. Uh, and you can get overwhelmed by them. And so you, you sort of focus on things that are a little bit more tangible, a little bit easier to touch, but ultimately probably mm -hmm. has very little like long-term impact on, on the actual, uh, problem mm -hmm. that you're trying to solve, which kind of brings me back to Sway. I think you, you alluded to like, you know, what's the intervention or what are the things you considered? What are you trying to do? Look, we, we may not s succeed. We may not lead to this paradigm change in how we organize. But my bet that I'm betting on is that if we can prove this in some of the best companies in the world, that this process outperforms the other way of doing things or is as good as the other way and gives you all these other benefits, then we're, we have normative narratives on our side. You're building evidence. We're building evidence and we're building excitement about this, right? So let me ask you this. How do you know if it's working? Like, what's your metric? There, there are a bunch. We look at like very quantitative things, like the the number of ideas that were generated, like a side by side. You know, the old way of doing things versus this new way. Like number of ideas, throughput of ideas, uh, number of decisions made, value of those decisions uh, against the cost of the platform. Uh, we look at engagement rates, uh, daily active, monthly active, weekly active users compared against the previous way of doing things. We then also do like 
qualitative surveys on levels of trust, levels of productivity, uh, levels of satisfaction, those types of things to, to help show that people, like when people feel respected, they contribute more. They contribute that extra discretionary effort when they feel like the process is fair and and merit based. It's transparent. It's not some backdoor stuff going on. So we have a bunch of metrics that that do that. But to, to, so I don't lose this point. For us, look, if we can if we can nail the normative uh, narrative, once people found out that Uber works and Uber can be better than the taxi system, no one was like, oh, well, you know that was interesting. Let's like go back to the taxis. Then it became an, a normative <laughs> battle between the status quo and the future, which will carry out for 10 years until that old way is just no longer economically viable or culturally viable. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to do the same thing over this period of time. There are a number of startups like us that will work on this problem of, of upgrading the way that we make decisions, upgrading the way we organize our institutions and companies. And we're going to win the normative battle through proving it works in the best places. And then people will just expect that this should happen in other places that are more meaningful, like cities, like their governments, like, you know, their homeowner associations or student uh, parent teacher boards or places where real like decisions really, really matter and input and inclusivity really, really matters. You've really stoked my curiosity around this. I don't actually know what it's called, but this, you know, this almost like intervention design, this systemic thinking, like all this early framing work that is really what sets up everything that comes downstream. Is there a name for this? Like if I want to go start Googling on this, like what should I search? I don't know. I, I, like, I, I don't know what it is, but I would probably look at like systems design first. There's like Eleanor mm -hmm. Ostrom and a whole bunch of other people that, have looked at systems and levers and, and systems change, like really scientific methodological mm -hmm. way of looking at how to look at uh, systems. There are probably a lot of systems theorists out there, it, or organizational theorists in business schools or in, in public policy schools, but I, I, I there isn't like a business model canvas for this, like that you can just like find and fill out, but maybe we can create one, Andrew. Yeah, it, it could be fun. I want to go ahead and start to uh, start to close out here with a couple of rapid fire questions. They are short questions that I like to ask everybody. Uh, so the first one is, what is a quote that's important to you? And what about it speaks to you? It's a quote on my arm. Uh, you can't see it. I can see it's tattooed, but I can't read it. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a stanza from a poem from Rudyard Kipling. Uh, it says, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. Mm. What this means, I, I, it's an aspiration and something that I think I'm becoming much more uh, grounded in as I, as I mature, as I age. Uh, you know, I'm a dad. Uh, I have two little girls. Uh, the world isn't really just about me and my, my winning or my kind of validation. But there was a time where it was where I didn't have the same responsibilities or didn't have the same wisdom or understanding about how the world works. Didn't have the same humility, I would say, about it. And there was a huge drive to, to try to be validated and be heard and, and be right and do the righteous thing and all that stuff. And this quote just sort of like transcended a lot of that. Like whether you win, whether you lose, whether you, that's not the point. The point is that you tried and also you were able to let go of all of it because it's, it's, it's not yours. It's, they're, they're not your possessions. None of this is, uh, you, you, mm -hmm. you're having an experience and hopefully the experience enriches you as a person and makes you a less possessive, less antsy, more balanced, more, more contributing person. So that quote speaks to me a lot. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So at this stage in your life, it's very interesting what you're just saying about, you know, there was an earlier phase where you were you need, had very strong needs for validation and to be right. And I think it's stuff we all go through. But at this point in your life, like now, what does success look like for you? I think a lot more of the same. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, like I, I, I like the life that, that we have and the design of it. Like we, we live more or less within our means. We have a, a two-bedroom condo 
uh, and both, you know, my two little girls live here and, uh, you know, me and my wife are here. So the office is now here because of COVID, like maybe we'll, we'll expand a little bit, uh, outside of that if things improve. If not, we're, we're remote and we'll do that. Success means that I get to do this for the next 10 years and we incrementally build the normative narrative of, of winning and of like upgrading. And each year there are gains that, that happen along that path, but it's an irreversible path. There's no like we help more people vote or we got more people engaged in a shitty broken system. It's like, no, we help people learn to be more self-managed, learn to create ideas that, uh, that really were the right ones for their cities, for their communities, for, for whatever. Seeing more examples of the more tangible examples coming out of Sway, having Sway be applied in more use cases uh, and eventually in more government settings, uh, that is success to me. And hopefully the, the benefits of that, the fruits of that are we earn a little bit more, more money, we have a little bit of a better life. Uh, I have a farmhouse somewhere in the interior or in, in Greece where I can just go chill out in and and do work in and do retreats in paired to all this. I've been doing a lot of meditation over the past three years. Uh, it's a daily ritual for me now. And I've been, uh, starting to experiment, uh, a lot with psychedelics as well for, for personal development, for personal growth, for seeing some blind spots that, that have been ingrained and embedded in me. And I think making a lot more time for that, over, over the years, uh, is, is what success or what happiness kind of looks like. Sue's so just in closing out, what would you like to leave the listener with? Don't be a bystander. There are so many things that will tell you you're, you're wrong. You're going to look dumb. Uh, you should be worried about your image. You should preserve your social capital. Don't say that. Don't do that. I mean, we're living through a pandemic that has upended our entire global economy. It's, it's going to upend our political systems. The need for new solutions and new thinking is now at more than ever, ever before. If you're sitting on some ideas that, that you think the world needs, if, even if they're as dumb as sway or as like impossible as sway, or some of the other ideas I mentioned, the re replanting drones or whatever, what they do is that they, they're contagious. That inspiration to try something disruptive and evolutionary is contagious. We need a lot more of that. Our world needs better systems. Our, our world needs more ethics. Our world needs an integration of morality and technology. We can't just go by the inertia we've had. Please don't sit around and consume the the information coming to you go contribute what the world needs beautiful all right and so for anyone who wants to uh, reach out to you get in touch with with you personally or with sway what's the best way that they can do that where would you where would you direct people they can email me uh sushant at sway.io hit me up on twitter hit me up uh, over email for any entrepreneur struggling with some of these issues they're at earlier stages uh that thinks that i can be helpful to them please reach out uh, it's our duty to reciprocate the efforts and, and, uh, you know, service and whatnot that we've received. And I'd love to help, uh, if I can. So please reach out and go after your, your dreams, go after your dreams. Don't let dreams remain dreams. That's the last thing I want to leave people with. Thanks so much for what you're doing. Keep it up, my man. Andrew, I love you, man. Thanks for, for the opportunity. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us on iTunes. That helps us reach way more people and build this community up. For show notes, links to the resources, and everything else we discussed, please go to enliven.fm. Feel free to reach out with questions, feedback, or just to say hello by emailing connect at enliven.fm. Be sure to subscribe, and until next time, my friends, leave them better than you found them. We'll see you soon.